Um, I just wanted to remind you, um, can you please make sure you visit the exhibition? Hopefully you've all been down there and you will be tomorrow. Obviously we are enormously grateful to our exhibitors um, for, for supporting these events. Um, and I'm just going to straight away um, welcome Professor Andrea Nelson from Leeds to the platform. She's been here already once or twice today. Once, yeah. twice, I've lost count. And Andrea is going to talk about um, Codify, which was a trial that looked at wound swabbing, and I listened to Andrea telling me about this trial in a car back sometime. I thought, we need to know about this. I think this is a really interesting topic, so I really hope you share my enthusiasm. I'm sure you will. Over to you. Thank you, Yuna. So um, we conducted a, a cross-sectional study asking the question, do you need to use swabs or samples, tissue samples, cutting bits out of um, patients in order to identify the flora um, contributing to infection in the diabetic foot ulcer? Clearly, diabetic foot ulcers need rapid treatment so that the clinical sequelae of infection are minimised and this can become uh, a medical emergency. So it's a really important question. Um, should we sample with tissue or with swabs? In order to be able to make that decision, you need to understand, do I get the same information from taking a, a, a tissue sample as I would if I took a local swab? Or do I get different information? And if it is different, do you get more things reported in a swab? For example, does it pick up more contaminants or do you get more information because it, it collects from a wider area? Or does it report less things than you get from a tissue sample because it doesn't get into the depth of the wound where there may be actually the organisms um, contributing to infection thriving? Or do they simply disagree but not in a systematic manner? And furthermore, once you've analysed whether there is any difference between swab sampling and tissue sampling, does that actually matter at all to the clinician? Or is this something that actually would have been relevant had you been able to get that information instantaneously whenever the patient presented, but it's now four days after you sent the swab or the tissue sample away, and hence that information isn't relevant anymore? Or does it matter in terms of the actual information wouldn't have led to a different clinical action? So we set out to see whether wounds samples taken by swab or tissue were different so people with an infected diabetic foot ulcer, as determined by the clinician, had both a tissue and a swab um, collected at the same time. And a small subgroup also had an additional sample taken to send away for genetic fingerprinting, is what I call it, but it's actually PCR. Um, so more sophisticated analysis than we're able to get in most um, microbiological labs at the moment. So patients where our normal um, 18 plus with an infected foot ulcer and the statistical methods we used were to assess agreement and um, uh, tested that for significance using kappa to see if that was greater agreement than would be expected by chance, and also McNamara's test for statistical significance testing. So we screened 680 patients to be able to recruit 400. So this wasn't a trial in that we didn't um, allocate some people to testing in one way and other people allocated to testing in another way. All of our 400 patients were both exposed to tissue sampling and swabbing. So we had information on both diagnostic techniques. So while 401 patients were registered, data was only available on 400, and of those, only 395 had full results from both their tissue and their swab. So for the comparisons I'm going to present today, most of those are based on 395. 
The patients weren't unusual. They looked like regular kind of diabetic food ulcer attendees, i.e. mainly male, mainly had um, uh, the distribution between neuroischemic and neuropathic ulceration was not unusual, and 47% had, um, had used antibiotics very recently for a median of seven days. And what, oh sorry, I'll go through that one. The ulcers were also kind of normal in terms of the depth of the ulceration. So around about a third were superficial and a third were grade two and about a third were deeper ulcers. So a good distribution across the grades. And as I noted, 47% um, were on antibiotics already. The first interesting finding from um, the, the results that I wanted to share with you today was that despite these being patients with a clinical assessment of diabetic foot ulcer infection, actually when we considered the swab results alone, 30% of the samples came back with no pathogens reported. So it's a, that's either poor sampling technique or something around the sample to laboratory chain that meant that nothing was grown. <coughs> it may also be that we are over um, diagnosing infection because of the sequelae of not diagnosing enough infection in this important um, population. So 30% um, of the swab samples were no growth detected and um, that was around 14% um, for the tissue samples. So fewer of the tissue samples were found to be um, clean. And the pathogens reported, um, mostly gram-negative cocci and some of the ones that you would normally expect to see, Staph aureus, et cetera, et cetera, were, were there. So nothing terribly unusual. This describing the population for you. And um, because there's a large number of um, bacterial isolates described there. Um, I'm just going to give you an example of how we've summarised one of them and then take you through the summary of the, the, the whole of the slides, um, sorry, the, that whole list, to indicate where there was reasonable agreement between swab and tissues and those bacterial isolates where there was not high levels of agreement between um, the, the, the various samples. So in each of these samples, I'm going to walk you through um, a, a two by two table. Um, when I um, teach with UNA, which I um, have the opportunity to do from time to time, I always point out that these two by two tables feel a bit Irish because they're four by four. Um, but I'm allowed to say that because I'm Irish. Um, so what we'll do is walk you through a sample with Pseudomonas. And what this table shows you is that if you look at the top there, the tissue results were that in 369 people there was no Pseudomonas reported and in 26 there was. But if you look at the swab results, so down this side, that shows that the number of people in whom Pseudomonas wasn't reported was 369, and the number of people in whom their swab sample didn't report Pseudomonas was 26. If this world were perfect, those would be the same 26 people. This world is not perfect. So that shows you immediately that if you simply do a study and you say, oh, we found 6% um, reported pseudomonas with a swab sample and 6% reported pseudomonas with a tissue sample, they must agree that that isn't showing you that level of detail because actually there were eight people in whom the swab reported the swab did not report pseudomonas and the tissue sample did and vice versa so it's slightly more complex isn't it but this is the challenge of summarizing agreement from two diagnostic tests <laughs> 
So we asked a number of questions. Um, do they report the same number of things? So for Pseudomonas, they did. But is there some disagreement? There is some disagreement. And how we describe that disagreement is by summarising in something called CAPA, a statistical measurement of agreement. I've put this little temperature chart at the bottom to just highlight that um, a high agreement um, of about 0.8 and above, sometimes called almost perfect agreement, um, is there in bright green, so that when we come to see the summary results, you've got a visual indicator of what's happening. So for Pseudomonas, there was high overall agreement. Only in 4% of the tests was there a variation between sampling technique. Um, and the kappa was high at 0.67. And when my statistical colleagues say, aha, but that's not everything, I can make that even better by giving you a better test. And I go, please be my guest. You're the statistician. They um, prescribed me the PABAC, the Prevalence and Bias Adjusted Kappa, which um, allows us to adjust for um, Kappa not being very good whenever um, events are very rare. So um, Kappa was strong for that Pseudomonas. And for Staphylococcus aureus, there was a similar pattern. You will see that um, 125 were reported in tissue and 125 in the swab, but they're not all the same people. So there's some people in whom a swab is picking it up and the tissue sample didn't. That's not surprising because it might be collecting it from a different place on the swab, on the, on the wound surface area. And um, so when you summarise the results for Staph aureus, then you see that there's no difference in reporting if you report it that way. There's high agreement and a kappa and a PABAC that are high. So very good agreement. So if for all of the isolates that we're interested in in the diabetic foot, you had very high agreement between the swab and the tissue sample, you might conclude that you could interchange the swab for the tissue sample because you would still get similar information. But that doesn't appear to be the case for all of the isolates. So I'm going to show you some examples where that was not the case. So for example, um, Carini bacterium, I always have to put my teeth in when I'm saying these, these um, uh, is a nice example of um, a, a rarely picked up um, um, isolate from the swab only. There were only four reports in the swab and in the tissue there were 36. So here's an example where there was disagreement and a tissue sample picked up that bacterial isolate much more often than the swab did. And of course, we don't know if that issue arose at the sampling stage or at the transporting and its surviving stage, whether it had been there when it left the leg and whether it died on the way to the lab. So um, there's, there's a couple of things which may be happening here. And this is a summary of the results as a whole. If you remember in our temperature chart, um, green is for very good agreement. And as you get hotter and redder, then you get less good agreement between swab sampling and tissue sampling. And so there are a number of isolates here down at the bottom um, for Pseudomonas, for Staph aureus, whether it's methicillin sensitive or methicillin resistant, there was very high agreement. And similarly for Streptococcus, there was very high agreement. And for gram negative bacilli, good agreement with a um, kappa of 0.63. So um, this shows that it's a complex picture around whether you can use tissue sampling to replace swabbing or substitute them equally. Because in some settings, people do not wish to necessarily use tissue sampling. Um, we also um, analysed um, within the study the extent of agreement by saying 
Were there occasions when the swab reported additional things over and above what the tissue sample, because remember it will come from a, a larger area on the wound surface. And that was the case in 32 um, of the, the pairs. However, five times more often, you had additional information from the tissue report over the swab report. And in a small number of cases, there were different isolates um, identified. So we summarised the results from this aspect of our study by noting that in a significant minority of patients, clinically infected foot ulcers yielded nothing whenever they, the swab or the tissue sample was sent to the lab. But that was less often the case for tissue samples. For three of the um, bacteria that we might be interested in clinically, for Staph aureus, MRSA, um, so both methicillin sensitive and methicillin resistant Staph aureus and Pseudomonas, there was no clear difference between sampling using um, tissue and swab samples. But for the other isolates that we're being interested in, the potential pathogens, then swabs did um, find those bacterial isolates less often than tissue samples. So this may be because of things dying um, between collection, transport and plating and culture. But crucially, we don't yet know whether this different information would actually make a clinically important difference. So um, the work that we're doing now is um, preparing the report for you on a sub-study that we did, which looked at the agreement for 299 patients. And we presented their results blinded to the clinician, i.e. the clinician didn't know if they had come from a swab or a tissue, to see if the clinician indicated that a change in antibiotics was required. We know that this did result in a larger proportion of clinicians recommending a change or an initiation of antibiotics when they consulted the results taken from tissue. So there's a real potential that this could lead to clinically important differences. But our study wasn't designed in order to report that clinical difference. It wasn't able to actually look at clinically important outcomes, i.e. did patients resolve their infection. But um, there was 9% more of the patients were deemed to require a change in treatment when tissue samples were available than where swab um, results were available. So we're looking at whether it's feasible to now do a study where patients would either have tissue samples taken or swab samples taken. And if you're interested in that, please do approach me later. Furthermore, the last part of this study indicates the very poor prognosis of patients that we identified through Codify. At 12 months, 15% um, of them had died within the previous 12 months and 17% had a lower extremity amputation and a further 6% had experienced revascularization surgery. So this remains a really important population with a poor prognosis and for whom we can make improvements in care. Thank you very much to all our sites and to the funders. Thank you, Yuna. Are there any questions? I've just realised. Oh, thank you. I couldn't remember who had the microphone. <laughs> any questions? Yes, somebody at the back, please. Yes, you. <laughs> I feel like David Dimbleby. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, Andrea, hi. This, uh, that was really interesting, fascinating stuff. Um, you kind of, I, I think, indicated something rather tantalising to microbiologists, which is the PCR analysis. Yeah. And I just wonder whether any of the difference that you've just reported to us was driven more by the PCR data. I know we have rather 
potentially fewer of those than you did of the, the traditional culture-based um, analysis. But what were the differences between the PCR and the culture-based analysis? The, the results that I've presented to you today are all totally based on traditional microbiological plating culture and sensitivity, not on the PCR. And the PCR was um, achieved on only 16 patients to be able to, to mirror what did you get from plating and culture as opposed to PCR. And what you get with PCR, genetic fingerprinting, is a lot more, I was going to say, data rather than information. So you get a, a big long list of stuff that's in the wound or has been in the wound because you get the ability to detect dead stuff as well as you get so you can detect the dead bacteria because you're looking for their DNA. So you get stuff that might have been important a couple of weeks ago, not necessarily stuff that's important now. Stuff is a technical term, by the way, for the, for the recording. Um, so one of the real challenges is how do you differentiate between a, a long shopping list of stuff that's in the wound as opposed to what is causing my patient a problem. Thank you. Any other questions? No, we'll move on in a second. Just to encourage you, one of the best ways about learning about research is actually getting involved in some active research. I cannot say that more often. It's how I started learning. So if any of you do have an interest, do go and talk to Andrew and you might be able to get involved. It's, it's a great way to learn about research. Thank you very much, Andrew.